Hi everybody, I'm Chief Meteorologist and Hurricane Specialist Ivan Cabrera here with Meteorologist Cindy Pressler and Meteorologist Dave Warren. It is now August. We are into the month where things really ramp up as far as hurricane activity and so we wanted to give you an update on where things stand. If any signals have changed that we look at to forecast what's going to be ahead over the next uh, peak months of hurricane season and uh, we'll go through uh, a bunch of things that I think uh, have been so far quite interesting across uh, the Atlantic. But just to recap things uh, as far as where we are are, yeah, we're getting into that peak season. We start obviously in June and July where we had a flurry of activity. We had Brett and your namesake, Cindy. Cindy. Yep. Uh, very mm -hmm. unusual to have something out in the eastern Atlantic like that. We call it the main development region and we'll chat a lot about that, the MDR. So we had that first flurry, then we, had, we haven't had much uh, activity. And then now, look at the peak here. From August 1 to September 1st, we just almost climb vertically. And uh, there's a good reason for that as conditions have become more more favorable for storms to develop in the whole Atlantic Basin, not just some areas. We first start in the Caribbean Gulf and then we expand out this time of year. So there we are, Arlene, Brett, Cindy, and we've had our first hurricane. What did Don. you think of Don out Don. there? It, it was it, so it happened so quick. It went right over the Gulf Stream, right out in the middle of the mm -hmm. Atlantic, 20 days before August 11th when we typically get our first hurricane. So it was brief, but it was there. Yeah, I think most people wouldn't even think that we, we've had a hurricane so far. Don was the thing that was spinning up. Cindy and I have been following that like every day it was like is this going to be the end no it just hung, hung in there and then it finally got enough wind speed uh, maximum winds that it was classified a hurricane Arlene that was interesting right that was a lot of heavy rain and then we had those weird storms of Brett and Cindy that we can typically see off of cold fronts that can develop along the eastern seaboard in the Gulf but something as far out as uh, the Cabo Verde Islands and it just went they both went and uh, had favorable yeah. conditions to develop Overall, though, I think we're pretty pretty fortunate that we haven't seen anything that has threatened any kind of land so yep. far. That certainly is good news, but remember last year? Yes, every yeah. season is different. And, you know, it's so interesting. We'll, we'll talk about these forecasts and the signals that we look at here, but it, we always end, you know, saying the same thing. It only takes one. Uh, and, you know, the El Nino is getting going, which favors below normal cyclone activity, but um, I'll never forget, 92 was an El Nino year in our first storm yeah. late in August obviously Andrew so uh, you know every season is definitely different so far this is what we typically see you know when we look back at the last 30 years we typically have 14 named storms half of those become hurricanes and then out of those seven three become major hurricanes so cat three or higher let's talk about the forecast so far Cindy uh, as far mm -hmm. as what NOAA's put out you know we continually get updates out, out of this but uh, we at the beginning thought it was going to be a less active season right that's the way everything was pointing that was the ingredients that we had but as we get deeper and deeper now through July and now into August, those warm sea surface temperatures, that seems to be the big prevailing uh, element that we think is going to push this season just a little bit higher. Right. And El Nino is a word, you know, people are familiar with uh, La Nina as well. Uh, you know, it's just one of the signals that we look at. There are a lot of other things like sea surface temperatures that can have a big impact on what kind of season we get. The forecast from NOAA, you know, it's a, it's a big range. We get that, you know, 12 to 17. So so I like this range because it just gives you an idea of, you know, how how not 100% these forecasts are. You know, you can end up with 12 or you can end up with 17. If you end up with 12, it's below average, 17 is above average, so something in the middle. Uh, so these can be uh, a little bit tricky. Obviously, the, the more storms that form, the higher the chances uh, that a landmass will get hit, but it's, you know, it's, it's not a guarantee. So as we head into uh, August, guys, let's talk about uh, this uh, feature here that uh, we look at through the uh, now getting into the peak season. Right, so this is where we see uh, typically storms originate and it's pretty much everywhere. Now we're yeah. in the, really seeing the warm water. Uh, we've highlighted the areas though where we typically see the storms come in right through that main development region and they typically track to the west and there is also a little activity that can develop right off the east coast here. So these mm -hmm. are the areas to watch mainly uh, they're between Cabo Verde and the lesser right. Antilles there but right through that main development. And you region. see that pocket there of deeper yeah. red. Climatological Speaking, when we look back at the last 30 years, 
you know, most of the storms, most of the hurricanes, in fact, have developed uh, east of the Lesser Antilles, which is an area we're familiar with, obviously, and we look at very closely. Uh, you know, and that that uh, that uh, darker color off the eastern seaboard, you know, a lot of the storms sometimes can uh, develop off of fronts. Sometimes, you know, they'll go around that Bermuda high. So picture the high being here, and we get that clockwise flow around it. And so the storms want to tend to go north. You know, it's, it's rarer for them to come completely make a beeline towards, you know, the Bahamas, Cuba, and into and into Florida. If that high strengthens, then these arrows, you know, can curve a little bit. So, but generally speaking, this is this is how we fare uh, during the month of uh, August. And of course, we start in June and July, just primarily looking yeah. at the Gulf and into uh, the Caribbean. So it's a huge area, right? So we go from roughly 10 to 20 uh, you know, degrees as far as uh, the latitudes here, but we go from Africa all the way now into uh, the Caribbean. So let's talk about why this area, guys, is so, um, it is called the main development region uh, as conditions become more favorable here. So one of the things that we look at so far, uh, one of the ingredients is the dust, right, that is coming off Africa. Let's talk about how so far that's fared with the uh, storms that we've been seeing. We've had so much dust. <laughs> Out in the Atlantic, yep. and we've had it over Florida, which it, has been it is, good. They do call it a Saharan dust season here, Correct. So, right. uh, like July, and sometimes it can lead right into August, but we still have a little bit of out there, and it really t kind of suppresses everything. Very dry, dusty air. We see it come over here mm -hmm. to South Florida mm -hmm. sometimes. We've had some this season. Yeah. Dust and is it, a good thing when it, it comes to the thing. tropics. Not such sure. a good yeah. thing for the, those of us that have breathing issues, yeah. but that dust works yeah. well out in the tropics. And it, you know, the, all the uh, the way a tropical storm uh, begins, the way a hurricane begins. It's just a cluster of thunderstorms. Just like when we talk about this air, the Saharan air and the dust getting to us, sometimes we have rain chances down to zero or 10. It's the same reason here with this cluster of thunderstorm activity, those, these easterly waves that we talk about. If they ingest this dry air, which they do if they're moving in that direction, uh, they could really just uh, not just inhibit uh, uh, development, but any development that tries to get going just get, get squashed uh, rather quickly. So you see these robust waves sometimes coming off Africa and you're thinking, oh, this is, you know, this is going to be something, but uh, the Saharan dust takes care of it. The issue is, though, now we're getting past the peak of the season. Starts to thin out. And the, the concentration yeah. of the dust starts to thin out, right. and so now things become more favorable, which is why we have the MDR. What are we looking at here, guys? The, the, the shear. Shear, wind shear. That's the winds that work against a system. That right, they tear change them up. direction with height. They can rip apart storms, but if there's no shear, then that's favorable conditions. Right, and we'll talk about it. So the thunderstorms try to rise into the atmosphere. And you think of like this giant fan, which is the wind shear blowing the tops off of the thunderstorms. It just physically disrupts that process of, of you know, of uh, tropical cycles. Tropical storms, hurricanes, they love areas of high pressure on top of them. That means generally quiet conditions so they can really become uh, the efficient heat engine uh, that they are. And uh, to be an efficient heat engine, we get this, right? Yep. Sea oh. surface temperatures. We've been looking at these numbers. Something uh, you know we haven't seen this early yeah. in the season. This has been a big story this entire summer. These temperatures are off the charts hot, and that heat goes all the way into the North Atlantic. So what is that going to do to our season? Yeah, the, even the, the the warm right. The question is: is uh -huh. will El Nino and create more wind shear to offset that, right. or will we look at these unseasonably warm uh, right. water temperatures? And these are. This will take us now to the the competing signals. So let's just recap. What El Nino is. There's South America, there's the equatorial Pacific, and so you see that bubble of orange there. Those are temperatures that are above average for sea surface temperatures for this time of year. So when you get that strip like that, that is a classic El Nino. In fact, the uh, uh, NOAA has put out an El Nino advisory. It was a watch earlier in the season, now officially an advisory, because obviously an El Nino has developed. El Nino is important with hurricanes and any tropical system because typically for our neck of the woods here in the northern hemisphere, western hemisphere, we tend to see hostile winds that develop. And as Cindy was talking about, these thunderstorms that try to get going can be disrupted by these very strong winds that uh, set up and, and, you know, the storms try to get going, but then all of a sudden, there it is. The winds just kind of lop off the uh, top of the storms and inhibit, right. um, you know, development. 
So let's talk about a little bit about these two things. So we have the sea surface temperatures, super warm. That's a plus for hurricanes, they like that. But then we also have the wind shear that's gonna develop. So my question is, with these above average temperatures, are we gonna generate a lot of tropical waves that could become tropical depression storms, but then they'll reach the Caribbean and then get you know lopped off by the wind shear. So now all of a sudden we have- We had wor we're, work we're trying to work against it here right. because the, the water's warm, but we have uh, El Nino. So uh, this is what it could uh, mean for us in, in uh, maybe towards the Caribbean here. Right. We have average wind shear, but warmer ocean temperatures. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to see a little more wind shear develop with El Nino. Could that disrupt the storms? That's right. something to watch. Yeah, if we have average wind shear, that's not a good thing. We want strong wind shear, and for strong wind shear, you get a strong El Nino. But is that going to be enough to overcome what we've been talking about here, which is is really just a you know pocket of very warm sea surface temperatures? That energy that uh, the hurricanes that feed off of. We've also had a very wet and you know uh, vigorous monsoon season here across West Africa, and that does two things. It has generated a lot of dust to the north of that so it picks up all that Saharan dust and pushes it out into the Atlantic which is a good thing that suppresses tropical uh, development here but then you've got a very healthy monsoon so you get these tropical waves that will come off the continent there and will continue to provide the seeds for what ends up being you know a tropical storm right. or, or and these, hurricane. These storms are normal this is this is right. natural this is what we get all the time right these right. are not something different that we've had over the past five years they always have been coming off of Africa, but it's what happens out here in the water. Right. That's right. that strong water that acts like jet fuel once right. those temperatures are above 80 degrees. It is, degrees. and that's exactly what it is. And it's so interesting, you know, every season is different. So we have competing signals here. So I think the NOAA forecast is right on the money. It could be a below average season if El Nino really ramps up and if it can overcome, you know, the, 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 the positives of having such warm sea surface temperatures, or if it's a more average El Nino and the wind shear is not significant. The sea surface temperatures will breed stronger storms, and then there'll be really not much to stop them yep. once they get closer to the U.S. and uh, other land masses in the Caribbean. I guess we're just saying stay tuned. A lot to watch. Yeah, Absolutely. We'll let you know. And we'll keep <laughs> you posted. Noah will have an update uh, through the middle part of the season, but right now, uh, looking good, at least uh, for the next uh, couple of weeks. That will always change, and we'll keep you ahead of the storm. Thanks for watching.